Hello and welcome to Skirt Garage. My name is Connor and this right here is a 2017 AMG GTS. What we're gonna do today is talk about 10 possible things that you guys have never heard about this car. And we're gonna do that because I've now owned it for one year and 10,000 miles. And I have daily driven it, I have raced it, tracked it, had a ton of fun with this car, and I've learned a few unique features that this car has to offer. So let's talk about them. Let's go. Okay guys, for number one, we're gonna actually talk about the one kind of mechanical issue that can happen to these, the AMG GTSs. Uh, this is most common on earlier cars, like the Edition 1 in 2016, and some of the earlier cars from 2016, but there is a drive shaft failure and also a transmission failure that can happen to these cars. So before you buy it, you must get down and look, because the transmission on this car is actually a transaxle. It's in the back of the engine here, right kind of where the differential is. So you need to get down and you need to look and see if it's wet at all. If there's any weeping of any oil or anything like that, it is a huge red flag that needs to be addressed before you buy that car. Thankfully, Mercedes is very good to their buyers of this car and they're offering an eight year warranty on the transmission. And I'm not quite sure about the drive shaft. I think they did a recall on all the drive shaft issues, but Anyways, before you buy this car, definitely stick your head under the exhaust and see if there's any oil weeping from the transmission, whether it's a little or whether a lot. Okay, let's move on to number two. Okay guys, number two. This car has incredible braking performance. It's absolutely mind blowing what this thing can do with the right brake pads and tires. However, even though that the front calipers are six pistons, did you guys know that the rear caliper is actually a single piston? It's insane. It's crazy how expensive this car is and how track capable this car is for it to only come with a single piston rear. But that's not the only thing that's kind of interesting about this. If you do decide to track this car, race this car, all that kind of stuff, or even if you're driving like very, very heavy through canyons and all that kind of stuff, using your brakes a lot, you'll wind up um, really hurting that inside pad because this is like kind of like a clamp and it's only pressed from one side, the inside portion. So you may go to a track day and you might look at the outside of your pads and think, oh, hey, no, I'm good. I've got like half of my pad left, but you really got to be careful. You need to take the wheel off and look at the inside because that's the one usually it wears like a third faster than the outside pad. So kind of interesting. Let's move on to number three. Okay guys, for number three, we are in the car. I think it's in reverse right now, but what I really wanna show you is the forward-facing um, visibility. Overall, it is very good. You can see pretty much everywhere. You even got a little window back here for you to see your passing, but there's one very big blind spot, and no, it's not the cute little mirrors here that are like, you know, whatever, four inches tall. It is the actual mirror on the left over here. This mirror, when you pull up to a four-way stop, it is perfectly in your line of sight of another car approaching on that side. So you kind of have to do one of these things where you tuck your head forward and look between that little gap and then come back and that's how you know if someone's in that blind spot. Anyway, kind of silly, let's move on to number four. Okay guys, number four is actually about race mode in this car. And uh, if you've watched any of my other videos, I've had a lot of other sports cars and a lot of people ask me uh, how this car compares to my previous Jaguar F-Type R because they're both, you know, front engined, rear wheel drive, V8, big long hood. Um, when prices were new, they weren't too far off. So a lot of people ask me how this compares. And I always say that this car, you know, if you pay more for it, which you do, you know, generally speaking on the used, on the used market, um, what you pay for is the research and development. And I can't describe that better than when talking about the race mode in this car. I go to local track around me called Hallett quite a bit. And with other cars I've owned, 
the way I get the fastest lap times is by turning everything off. However, with this car, it's the first car I've ever driven where the nannies or the electronics aid you to become a faster driver. It's unbelievable. Race mode in this car, first off, you can't use it on the street because it will not shift unless you redline it. So like the only way this thing is shifting within race mode is if it goes to redline, which you can't drive a car on the street in bumper to bumper traffic, only shifting gears when you redline it. It's kind of not really possible. But back to what makes this car so impressive with the race mode is the, the engineers allow, I don't know how they do it or what numbers I had to crunch to do it, but they allow X amount of slip at the rear end and at the front end to the point where I've done like a four wheel kind of hop or slide that's enabled me to exit out of a corner faster and I don't feel the traction control or the stability control or anything like that kick in. car is so intelligent it allows you to do like little kind of mini drifts or power slide exiting a corner without cutting it at all and in fact the only time I've ever felt it really kick in and, and kind of reel me back is when I truthfully needed it so what you pay for when you you know get this car is honestly just the research and development done to make it faster anyway let's move on to number five okay guys for number five we are gonna talk about probably my favorite design characteristic of this car, and that's where they placed the engine. Now this is considered a front engine car, but also it's considered a front mid-engine car, and that's because the entirety of the engine starts behind where the front axle is. And that actually also creates a beautiful design element in this car. This car has a tremendous dash to axle ratio, which is of course the ratio between where the axle starts right here and where the dash starts way back there. It's a beautiful look and I really, really like it. Let's pop the hood real quick and I'll show you where the actual engine is. So the engine starts here. And this actual whole beauty cover, all it really houses is a power steering fluid, some coolant, and an extra coolant reservoir. There you go. Okay guys, number six, keeping in line with number five, the very long hood, this car has a very nice front bumper warning when you're parking it, which is very gracious of Mercedes, I have to say, because when you're really low in the car, the hood almost looks flat. It almost looks like it doesn't taper at all, kind of the very opposite of like a 911 where you really know where the front tire is just because of how sharply that front end dives. This is really, really long and it's really, really flat. And so as you're looking out there, even though I've owned this a year and I've daily driven it a ton, it's really confusing to know just how much room you have. It takes a while to get used to it. But Mercedes has these front parking sensors that are so accurate and so good on this car. I use them literally every time I drive it because you kind of just have to. So I'll show you what they look like real quick and then move on to number seven. Okay guys, for number seven, we're actually back at the rear of the car again. And I'm gonna show you a unique feature that a lot of the GTS or GT owners don't even really know that they have, and it's probably because it never works. And it's actually that you can use a kick sensor underneath the diffuser to allow the trunk to open if your hands were filled with groceries or whatever. Um, the reason why a lot of people don't know about it is because I swear it really doesn't work. To make it work, you have to have the key in your pocket and you kind of hover your foot underneath here. There you go, it worked that time. Most of the time you're standing around, just in case you thought I did it with my, my hand touching the key or something, I'll try it again. Yeah, 
There you go. Prime example of it not working. If I go faster. There it goes. All right. Okay guys, number eight. It's actually gonna be the emergency brake that turns on when you turn the car off. You see, this has a dual clutch and a lot of manufacturers, when they make a dual clutch, there's not necessarily a park gear. And so what they do is turn on the emergency brake for the rear uh, calipers and rotors to stop the car from putting any unnecessary pressure onto the transmission. However, this car automatically turns on as soon as you turn the car off. So after a heavy track day or heavy spirited kind of canyon run, when you get done, you have to turn the car off, allow the parking brake to turn on, then turn the car back into accessory mode, pull the, emer the parking brake uh, electronic handle on this left side over here, and then power down the car. That's the only way the emergency brake will not uh, negatively impact your rotor or pads. Anyway, let's move on to number nine. Okay guys, we are on to number nine. And this may come as a surprise or it may not, but this car is annoying to get in and out of, especially if somebody parks next to you. And you might be like, okay, well it's a sports car, they're all annoying. You're right, I've owned a ton of sports car and this one is really high up there with challenging to get out. I'm a pretty athletic guy, I'm pretty skinny, and it's still really hard for me sometimes. Let me show you why. The first reason is this car has two predetermined kind of stop points on its you know, open, open trackway, if you will. One is right here, and the only way this car is gonna stop or the door is gonna stop and open this wide is if no one's next to you. That's ideal. The other halfway point is about Sorry, that's all the way up, and this is the second one. Again, nobody can be next to you in a parking spot. This is the first stop point right here. And if you see how much room you have, we're talking like maybe eight inches. That's how much room you have to get out of this, which is extremely hard because if you look at the door, the entire door, it won't stop of course, but the entire door kind of leans back into the car. And so as you're trying to get out, you're running into this window and it's almost trapping you. The other thing that's annoying is the car has these, like I said, predetermined stop points. If you're in between that, like right there, it'll try to keep stopping you from getting out or keep kind of like closing. So you have to be very mindful with your hand if you're next to a car in traffic. The other thing that's annoying is, okay, you get in, no big deal, but this is how annoying it is getting out. You open it, that's usually as far as you can open if there's a car next to you. You have to find a way to hike your leg up, turn your whole body around, put your foot out through that door and try to not hit this on your way up. I know, you might be thinking this guy's a prima donna, but I promise if you're out and you're parking at like Target or something and somebody, because you know they will, comes up really close and parks next to your car, you're gonna rue the day. Anyway, let's move on to the next one, number 10. All right guys, we're getting to the very last one. It's number 10. And this one is really pretty common of all Mercedes. It's not necessarily unique to this car. It's just unique because of how long the hood is on this car. So number 10 is of course the full Mercedes service position. If you did not know, you can open your hood the normal amount, which is about right there, and that allows you to work on your car, but Mercedes also allows you to open it this far, which is, of course, the full Mercedes service position. And they do this so that they can have unrestricted access to an engine that's so far back placed in the engine compartment. So, pretty cool, if this did, fly up on you while you were driving, you'd be in some serious trouble because this would be like the biggest air brake known to man. Thankfully, it's got one, two, three 
hood latches that hold this sucker down. Anyway, that is it.